going to your butt. Da -da -da. <laughs> Boop. Welcome to episode 71 of the Civil War Breakfast Club podcast. Tonight I am joined by Civil War nerd extraordinaire Darren. I am Mary, his Canadian co-host, who has all the determination in the world to not make this intro into a train wreck. But like Butler at Fort Fisher, I feel every single time. Wow. And, and, and you did. I did. And you did. I'm Good, consistent. Well at least I'm, con least are. I'm consistent. You are consistent. You are I mean, I I have a lot of determination to do a really really good intro, but you know, and, and just it looks like you're gonna choke, but you pulled it off, so it was perfect. So <laughs> I kind of do, it, yeah. I know it looked like I was so, gonna choke anyway, there, but I got so what, it. What is happening on episode seventy one? of well, the old podcast. Here we go. What's happened with you? What's new? Well, not too much. Uh, we're almost part way through January, which it's going by quick, which is, I guess, a good thing, right? But yeah, into 2022. And yeah, things are just moving along. How about you? What's been going on? Oh, it's it, not much, not much. It was pretty cold here lately, pretty cold. And now Same it's, here. Uh, it was saying, I guess that's part of living in the Northeast around January. I guess it's part of the course. Well, we have the but, exact um, same weather, although it was a little bit uh, cold there today where you are than what it was yeah, where I was. I, was. I, I would definitely agree with that. Speaking of cold... What's going on? What's in your cup today, Mary? <laughs> so I am drinking by Great Lakes Brewery out of Toronto, Octopus Wants to Fight IPA. And I'm drinking it out of my Ride with the Winter mug that John LaRoe so kindly sent us. And the reason I chose the Octopus Wants to Fight IPA is because it had kind of a water theme. And tonight with uh, our episode, we are going to be talking about the water again, like we did last week with Arkansas Post. And okay. what are you drinking well, you got a mug situation? or I just said I have it in my Ride with the Winter mug that we oh, got from show. John okay. LaRoe. Because okay, okay. it's, it's tough to show it on camera <laughs> no, <laughs> with the true. background. Okay. And what are you I'm drinking, bad. sir? Well, okay. Well, thanks for asking. I'm drinking a beer Ooh. called Pulp Juice from Woodstock uh, in Brewery. There's no correlation whatsoever to this episode, except that's what I bought. And, of course, I'm buying it out of my I'm the Reason Country Music is So Sad, William T. Sherman mug. Because not that he had anything to do with this either. I thought it was a good mug. I like that mug. And that's what I picked. So that's what you I get. Do so. ha you do have quite a strong mug game. And it was commented to both oh. of us recently by um, someone we know on Instagram that we both have strong mug, mug games, which is pretty awesome. Well, it's always it's always fun. It's nice to choose yeah. that. On the agenda today, Mary, we are going back east again. We We're are. Yes, back. we are. And this is actually the first of two parts. So oh, when, that's right. when that's we right. started researching Fort Fisher, we were like, ah, we can do it and, you know, we'll be able to do it one episode or whatever. But then we start looking at it. We're like, wow, it's really worthy of two episodes um, just because of all mm -hmm. that happens there and the importance of Wilmington and Fort Fisher and just kind of the background, like the setup to even the first battle which occurs in late December, 1864. You know, through 1864, you know, it, it's, um, it featured a lot of stuff going on in the East during the Civil War. And, but one town that doesn't get a lot of attention um, today, really, is the town of Wilmington in North Carolina, right? You know, at the onset of the war, Wilmington was kind of a small town, about 10,000 people. And uh, it, it wasn't as famous as some of the other seaport towns uh, in that area, such as New Orleans or Savannah. Wilmington, as we're going to talk about, may have proven to be the most important of them all. Now, real quick, Wilmington is the main seaport in North Carolina. It was on the Cape Fear River and is the only river in the state that flowed into the Atlantic Ocean, right? Mm -hmm. Because there are two ways into the river, it was a good place for blockade runners to enter and get to the town of Wilmington. So blockade runners were needed because of Winfield Scott's Anaconda Plan, yeah. which used naval vessels to have to block southern ports, including the Gulf Coast and the Mississippi River. Really what they wanted to do was deny the rebels from getting goods. I mean, there was more to it than just that. There was a bigger plan. That, but at the end of the day, what it really was was to squeeze the Confederacy to stop the rebellion, right? And Wilmington was the only Confederate seaport that offered entry and exits, which offered a huge advantage uh, for the town and the Confederacy overall. It did, yeah. And these blockade runners, they were bringing in supplies, but they were also going, when they left, they were taking tobacco and cotton to trade with the British, of all people. And they would go to the Bahamas, Bermuda, and they would also go north to a place they called to... Nova Scotia, oh, which I say, at the time, I, I get you, it. My, it's, not, gonna... it's not Canada, but it is Canada. So this is how the Canadians are involved, is the British are going to Nova Scotia, and so are the Confederates, and they're doing a little bit of tradesies. 
England was the primary trade partner in the Confederacy yeah, at the I know. time. Yeah. Through Bermuda, Bahamas, maybe even Kokomo, who knows, right? <laughs> that's what they were trying to do that. But I mean, as the, Funky as the town? war went on, I think that's a thing. But but you know, as the war went on, you know, Wilmington becomes a primary supply artery uh, yep. in their main seaport by 1863. By January, the beginning of 18, as early as 1863, Robert E. Lee married. He said, we must defend Wilmington at all hazards. And later he said, if Wilmington falls, I cannot maintain my army. Think of these supply places. You think of Atlanta, you think of New Orleans, you think of Mobile, you think of places like that. You don't think a lot about Wilmington. And, and, and you know, the, and the, the reason was due to, you know, to the, the blockade trade and that guarding to the sea. The gate of Wilmington was guarding, it was at Fort Fisher, right? Mm-hmm. Which stood at the peninsula uh, south of Wilmington. And it was the northern entry into the Cape Fear Harbor. Now, it was named after North Carolina State Senator named Charles Fisher, who uh, who got killed at First Manassas, in case you're curious where the name from. That whole area became such a primary focus of it. Now, Fort Fisher protected those blockade runners, as well as uh, Wilmington, and that railroad, especially the Wilmington and Weldon Railroad, right? And, and it was Lee's lifeline of supplies for his Army of Northern Virginia, I mean, for that reason, 1860, by 1864, Wilmington would eventually become the, the rebel's second most fortified city in the entire Confederacy on the eastern seaboard after, after Charleston. The whole thing with the importance of this fort is Porter was going to Lincoln saying, we need to get this. And he's kind of brushing it off like, oh, it's not important. It's not important. But the interesting thing about Fort Fisher, when you compare it back to the fort we just looked at with Arkansas Post is Fort Fisher is mainly made of earth and sand, which allowed it to better absorb the heavy fire from the Union ships, as opposed to being made with mortar and bricks, right? Mortar and bricks are going to crumble under a shell, whereas if you're making it of earth and sand, it's just going to absorb the impact of those shells. And it's going to be harder to destroy. Well, you look at the forts, the seaport forts, you look at things like like Pulaski at Savannah, or you look at Sumter and Charleston, those were taken down pretty quickly and pretty easily because because when they built those, um, even Arkansas Post, you, you, you mentioned, is it was really begging for artillery fires. A lot of engineers spent a lot of time figuring out these forts, and they all read a manual by a guy whose name is Dennis H. Mahan. Mm-hmm. Now, we talked about him. We, we had Kent Masterson Brown on real quick yep. from the West Point. He's a West Point theorist in that uh, engineer who was an expert on fortifications, right? Mahan, by the way, is also famous for his death in 1871. You know what happened to him? I can imagine it was not a pretty death. It was not. A, 1871, he was getting older. He, he was working at West Point, and he was his was losing the fastball. He couldn't really work anymore. One day, he's sailing on a boat down the Hudson River in 1871. He commits suicide by jumping onto the paddle wheel. That's how he dies. So he didn't make it, Mary. Oh, my um, God. I guess, D, I guess DQ wasn't hiring. And they had <laughs> <laughs> but but that's how that's how hey if he had been but, but, able to operate a blizzard machine i would have hired him he probably would have been maybe he would have jumped off the boat anyway probably, probably <gasps> would have done that but, why because i would have been his boss uh, i think i'd make an okay manager <laughs> but, but but to your point i mean instead of those structured walls like i mentioned before pulaski and sumter is they're built with sand and they're built low to the ground yeah. right mm-hmm. now you mentioned before about how the, the sand will absorb the artillery which is exactly true yeah um and since it was built on a peninsula, guess what you have? You got plenty of sand. So you have plenty of supplies to build it. And they had years to build this. They did. April, eight, April 1861, Fort Fisher was small, which is a few batteries and a couple of dozen guns. And the task of building it was given to a guy named Colonel William Lamb. Okay. Mm-hmm. And he took it upon when he got to he got there on July 4th, 1861. And he said it was a small work constructed of perishable sandbags, and its longest face was 100 yards. So when he gets there, it's a sandbox. That's all it really is. Yeah. And William Lamb, real quick, I know you have some background with him. He was a Virginian. Yeah. Okay. And he was going to be managing a bunch of North Carolinians. And I don't know if you know this, but they don't. You know. That would not be that would not be good at all. Um, so William Lamb, just real quick, he's a newspaper editor, he's a politician, he's a businessman, and he's a soldier. He's from Norfolk, Virginia, and he went to the Rappahannock Military Academy and College of William and Mary, where he got a law degree. But for some reason, these guys that get law degrees, for some reason, they end up going into the media. So he is the co-owner and editor of the Southern Argus newspaper. Um, He's also elected as a delegate to the Democratic National Convention. 
1858, he joins the state militia. He's part of the Woods Rifles. And in 1859, the militia he's part of is sent to Harper's Ferry during John Brown's raid. So he's part of this big historical moment. Mm -hmm. Um, And nobody ever seems to talk about Lamb at all, right? Um, In 1860, he's he's the presidential elector on the ticket of Breckenridge and Lane. And in 1862... Uh, or 1861, he's elected colonel of the 36th North Carolina Regiment. And as you said, July 4th, he is going to, uh, he's going to be given command at Fort Fisher. And he's not too impressed when he gets there at all with it. And the thing about Lamb is he is the one that makes Fort Fisher into this, like, kind of this, he takes it from being, as you said, the sandbox into this big fort that is basically, it's going to be near impossible for the Union to take it down. And the thing with him is he's not an engineer. But he he's had, not an engi- but he enjoyed he's studying an, it. He, he's not an engineer, and he's kind of a newbie with this. But he also saw, he was oversaw the building of a fort called Fort St. Philip, which turns to yep. Fort Anderson, which is right up the street, about 15 miles from Wilmington. He was a study man. He studied a lot of that Mahan. He studied Mahan as well as uh, those forts. He was also a Crimean War guru, the way you are with the Civil War, Mary. Yeah, right? yeah the, way with, the, way, the way I am with the Falklands War. I right? would say that's but, the way you are with the but, Civil but, War. But, but, he, but he, he studied that to a point where, you know, he for the next two and a half years, he said he wanted to turn that fort into the Malakoff Fortress, right? Yeah, I was just going to bring that, up Malakoff, which is in was Se- Sevastopol. I can't Sevstopol. say it. Sevastopol. Sevastopol. But 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 that's what he that's what his mindset was. He wanted to build that up. He was also he was benefited though because he was under the command of a guy named Major William Henry Chase Whiting. Mm-hmm. W H C Whiting, if you're nasty, okay. <laughs> but he was an expert engineer who quit the U.S. Army to join the Confederacy. Yep. He was from Mississippi, but guess where he went to high school? In Boston English, up the street here. Really? Oh, I don't know how that happens. Boston English is still still here. Still that's going. that really old. That's that school that's been there for like ever, right? Two of them. Yeah, English and Latin. They're two rival schools. Oh wow! You know? But that's where he went. So together, Lamb and Whiting, using five hundred men, primarily slave labor, and uh, and some some uh, soldiers, they're going to work on Fort Fisher, and they're going to. By the time 1864 rolls around and the fort becomes finally on Lincoln's radar, this thing is a friggin' monster. Mm-hmm. You know, um, Wilmington, what's funny about it, you mentioned a few minutes ago how Lincoln was kind of meh about it Wilmington. It should have been right? on his radar. I mean, but I say that and I've got Lincoln, like 160 years to look back on it, right? But, but. but it's it's not it was, it's not that it wasn't on his radar because he wasn't told about it. He was. David Porter, Admiral Porter, yeah. was always saying that this thing needs to be done. He recognized Wilmington for its significance, and he realized how how crucial the town in that fort was. Early in the war, he wanted to capture the town, but Washington had no appetite for it. Uh, mm-hmm. He made proposals to do it. They were insisting on sieging Charleston because of the political political impact where the war started. Yeah. So in 1862, by May, by May or so, the army did control a lot of the Confederacy, the Union, I mean, did did control a lot of North Carolina. They got the Outer Banks, yeah. a bunch of the rivers, a bunch of towns like New Bern, New Bern Beaufort. Basically, they, they controlled everything 50 miles north of Wilmington. The Union Army controlled. Now, the head of the Navy, Gideon Wells, the secretary, he's trying to get some support as well to get to finally do this. But finally, he kind of drinks the Kool-Aid on this Charleston thing, too. <laughs> and he calls Charleston's Satan, Satan's kingdom, which I call Columbus, Ohio. But that's Isn't that by, the entire right? state of Ohio? I, well, especially Columbus. Right? Minus Cincinnati. But, but, but with, with Gideon Wells being on board of Charleston, they're going to begin that 587-day siege of Charleston, the longest in the Civil War. They never really get it, but they siege it. But what happens is that siege of Charleston, that trickle effect, is that all those blockade runners who are running Charleston now will go into Wilmington, yeah. right? Thanks to the forts and the rivers, blockade runners are having astonishing success getting through. 80% success rate. That is crazy. Getting into Ch- I mean, that's, that's, I'm, you would have killed for an 80% on exam in school. You would have killed for that. Grade, I would have right? actually. I know you would have. <laughs> the result was funny was what happened in Wilmington. I mentioned before, it's a small little 10,000 person town. Yeah. Wilmington turned into Vegas. It turned into Atlantic City. Oh, it's like a bang now, barn, right? It, at overnight, it overnight, it went from this booming, you know, 
the seaport with all these people with it with it brought money and clowns and crime <laughs> and bang barns and everything else that these things come, come to do right but that's what happens a lot of the locals got the hell out yeah well, wilmington was turning into a happening place right the thing about it though is at, at this point the union they're just 90 miles away up in new Bern. so yep. uh, general you know general white we mentioned He's concerned about not only the naval attack, but he's worried about an Overland attack as well, right? The funny part about it was up until that fell, especially when Mobile fell in 1864, mm-hmm. they could have probably roller skated in and taken Wilmington. North Carolina was buffered by South Carolina and yep. Virginia, right? And they kind of, so you, you kind of tucked in just right. But um, if they listened to David Porter, they could have taken a naval assault. They could have taken it just like that because yep. Fort Fisher was still being built. Now, according to according to Porter, he says that if they attacked Wilmington as early as 1863, he thinks the war might have ended a year early. That's how confident he was. Holy and shit. How many, thousand, how many thousands of lives were those sold? Claiborne was somebody playing playing chess today. <laughs> if, but, if, if they listen to David Porter. But but also, like, you know, with Porter, when is he writing that? That's the thing, too. Well, he's up, well it's, it's, yeah, it's the hindsight. It's like what we, you know, we talk about all the time, like, with the memoirs, the hindsight that they have. But that could have happened, right? Because, like, Fort Fisher is not the fortress it is until probably 1864 because Lamb is still trying to build up, build it up and all that. It took takes him a well, while to he, do that. He is. From the sea, any attack of Wilmington is going to have to deal with this Fort Fisher. There's no yep. question about it. Yep. In the defenses that face the entry of the Cape Fear Harbor. Now, yep. Wilmington finally gets on old old Abe's radar in 1864. Yeah, after primarily Mobile. From, well, not just that, though, but for political reasons, too. Yep. Because Grant's Overland campaign is underway. Grant's letting the bodies hit the floor over and over <laughs> and over again. It's fast and furious, these battles. And Lincoln, don't forget, the election doesn't happen until November of 64. Yeah. So he's still dealing with that that quagmire and that stalemate between Grant and Robert Lee in Virginia. And he's worried about the prospects of election because yeah. all you're hearing in the North is the butcher, right? Yeah, all these bloody battles, Cold Harbor, wilderness, all this stuff, all these, these Union dead. So – Gideon Wells at this point is going to say, "Hey Lincoln, Lincoln, hey, um, I know you kind of met on Wilmington, but um, what do you think? You know, maybe you might we might get a win here. You might need this." And so Lincoln, he's starting to think, you know, because he wasn't a big coastal guy. He was focused on cities like Atlanta, places like that. But well, it's also thinking, the Navy. Well, the Navy kind of gets like it's like the redheaded stepchild, right? Like the Navy just they're like not really seen as a formidable force, it seems, but yet they are in the Civil War. No. I think so, but I think he, I think he, he right. It, it, you know, you have the you have the blue waters and the, and the brown waters. The yeah, you get the, the you that you get that right. And the focus was primarily on the on the brown waters. You're talking yep. Mississippi and you're talking Vicksburg yep. and, and all that stuff. The, the Arkansas River, and all, you know, all that stuff we talked about. You know, Lincoln's thinking, well, you know, if this attack on Wilmington happens, this is going to be something positive if we can get it yep. right. But he wants Grant's approval first. He's like, all right, Gideon. Okay, it's like saying that Gideon, right? Gideon. Future Starbucks cup name, by the way. Gideon. <laughs> oh, that has so, to okay. happen. He says, I'll let you attack Wilmington, but I really need Grant to approve this, okay? You have David Farragut, who we just mentioned. He had seized, uh, he had seized Mobile in uh, 1864. And so it, once Mobile falls, everybody, including the Rosewoods clown, knew <laughs> that Wilmington was next. The rebels knew, yeah. the Union knew that was going to be the target because it was the last real seaport. So Grant was equally meh about this as well because he doesn't want to give up ten thousand men. He's up to his ass in Robert E. Lee at this point, point. Yep. and now he's going to go. He wants to give ten thousand guys to go two hundred fifty miles south to go when he needs them to beat Lee. So he's like, shit, I don't think so. But the thing that Grant does understand is he understands the politics, and he knows that if Lincoln gets re- doesn't get reelected, guess who's out of a job? Grant. Exactly. Right. So he's like, well, I don't think I really want to do this. But I think I probably have to. So he blesses Wells' plan. He does. So with his approvals in hand now, Gideon Wells blows that conch shell that we yeah. talk about. And he puts his Navy together for his attack on Wilmington. He originally is going to want David Farragut to do it. But Farragut just got done with Mobile. He's like, you know what? No, I need, I'm on vacation. Yeah. You so know, he I gets his foster off. brother involved. He gets Port, his foster yep. brother Porter involved who just had that success in Vicksburg and, uh, and had a success in Arkansas Post we just talked about. Poor's going to come in that North Atlantic squadron. And by yep. October 1864, he's at Hampton Roads, Virginia. And he's assembling a beast of a fleet there. He's got 150 boats, of which he's going to pick 64 to make this Fort Fisher raid, right? 64 boats. This attack, when it does happen, is going to be the largest seacoast attack 
in the entire war when it goes down. But it's going to be not just on the Navy, it's going to be the Army. So on the yeah. Army side, Grant wants Godfrey Weitzel to command it, right? He does. Now, this, this is where history in the gray, the gray area, and this we don't really know. Weitzel's from Bavaria, okay? He's, a, he's, he's not from around here. He, his nickname was Dutch from West Point. <laughs> that was his nickname, right? And Weitzel was also an assistant to guess who? Dennis Mahan. He was an assistant to his. So he had experience working with forts. He, was, he worked with Pierre Gustave du Beauregard in New Orleans before the war. So he knew about as much about forts as anyone. So this guy knew quite a bit. The problem was this. The jurisdiction of that area fell under the Department of Virginia in North Carolina, which is its commander was a guy named Benjamin Butler, right? Yep. A good mass hole. Now, the also thing about a it is Democrat. He, he was, he was. But Butler was not aware that Weitzel was Grant's guy until he intercepted a message from Grant that was meant for Weitzel, okay? And he finds out then that he wants Weitzel to come in. He's going to command this force, and that's what he's going to be, right? It's quite possible Weitzel never got this message, that Butler got it and just never told him. Because Butler basically says, um, yeah, I'm, I'm the man, so I'm going to be leading the attack with David yeah. Porter. Now, but he's, but the thing know, about Butler is Butler is in Lincoln's favor, because Butler, despite being a Democrat and Lincoln being a Republican, Lincoln had kept him in charge because of the whole election thing, right? He's one of these guys that is brought in into the election, like Franz Siegel was brought back. Well, Butler was kept in because of the Democratic connections and the election and Lincoln need to secure that election. So I think Butler feels like he's, quote unquote, safe, right? Kind of like um, McClernand felt that way in our episode about Arkansas Post, that he's got uh, it in with me Lincoln. Uh, I don't know because he was coming off that fiasco at the at, um, the Bermuda thing, all that stuff. He yeah, did. He, he was he came to a bad time. But the thing about it though is it's very well publicized by anybody who studies this stuff of how much David Porter and Benjamin Butler hated each other. They just flat. We've used yeah. that phrase a lot here and there, but these guys legit hated each other, right? Um, so much so, Mary, if they had statues on Cemetery Hill, they'd face the other way from each other. That's how much they couldn't stand each other. No question. Okay. But in the end, um, you have one of the most crucial battles in the Civil War at that very moment being conducted by the two primary characters in the Step Brothers movie. Yep. Okay. That's what you had, right? They just couldn't stand each other. Now, um, Butler is going to devise a plan. And he's got this whole thing figured out, okay? He wants to take a boat. He wants to fill it with black powder. And he wants to sail it near Fort um, Fort Fisher and blow it up, you know, and blow the, the sand down, you know, little pig style. That's yep. what he wants to do, right? And then he wants, he thinks he's going to have his men strut in like Vince McMahon coming down the ramp. <laughs> That's WWE perfect. Rock. That's how he thinks they're going to str- they're going to walk into this yep. and capture the fort. Maybe at worst he's thinking it's going to cause a Sharknado. Who knows? But they, but there's not much of a chance of success with this, right? Now, Porter thought it was he's interested in the idea only as so far as, okay, this sounds just stupid enough to work, right? Yeah. Um, now, a union general and their chief engineer is a guy named Richard Delafield. He said the explosion, and I quote, would have the same result as firing feathers from a musket would have. That's what he said. Which would be a hell of a reactment to watch, by the way, shooting feathers on the mask. That would be amazing. And you know who, like, Grant is not, uh, like, he's kind of like, this is not going to fucking work. No way. But you know who's on board with it is Lincoln. Of course he is. Big noise is loud. Sounds fun. You know? <laughs> but, but but regardless, Butler's plan is given the go-ahead. Yeah. So, so Christmas Eve morning at 1.40 a.m., the Union vessel called the USS Louisiana is going to be loaded up with 215 tons of black powder, and it's going to be exploded near the fort. But the problem is, naturally, it's too far away. It's, yep. It drifts. It blows up. does not that it makes a big noise. The event is, is will be known as Butler's Folly. Now, the fiasco pissed off Butler because he, he, Butler wasn't there. No, Porter he, he went ahead and back. was like, okay. Well, he, he did. And then what happened was there was a storm. And Butler decided that he wanted to spend Christmas in Beaufort. Yeah. And so he didn't come. So when this thing happens, he's going to race back. Um, and he was pissed off. He blamed Porter and you know, blah, blah, blah. But what it meant for the big picture of this battle, this first, first battle of Fort Fisher was this is going to be led now by a massive, massive naval bombardment as the primary means to take down the fort. 
because the, the blowing up the boat's yeah. not going to work. We can't send infantry. It has to be Navy. So right around dawn, Porter's boats under a heavy morning fog are going to begin to move in a position of a place called Federal Point off the coast. By noon, six, those 64 warships are going to be there, They're including the five, Navy's five largest frigates, the yeah. Susquehanna, Susquehanna, the Wabash, the Colorado, the Powhatan, in the Minnesota, they're all going to open bombardments. Yep, and they fire close to ten thousand shells, that are only going to, as it's later discovered, uh, as it's later discovered, cause minor damage. And you know, Lamb's headquarters ends up getting destroyed in this. Um, Porter, however, believes that they had caused damage. Um, the firing of the monitors was excellent, and when their shells struck, great damage was done. And but on the other side, the Confederates are able to hit three of these ships directly. Um, and by evening, the Union transports have arrived. But the one thing that Lamb says about this is despite his headquarters getting, you know, destroyed and a couple other things in the fort, he said, never since the invention of gunpowder was there so much harmlessly expanded in the first day's attack on Fort Fisher. I mean, it was it was a big waste. Now, you know, Captain Samuel Hunter, 36 North Carolina, you know, he's going to say... Um, the first shot fired by the enemy was from the iron side. Soon after the bombardment commenced an earnest shot and shell, shrapnel flying as thick as hail, perhaps even hotter. So there was a lot. I mean, the fleet had over 600 cannon, including the Colorado, had 52 guns, which yeah. is more than Fort Fisher total. So um, it, it, it was a complete mess. And to your point, it's in too much. But just north of Fort Fisher on land, because they're still worried about an overland campaign yeah. there. The rebels had set up a defensive line to a place called Sugarloaf, right? There, under Robert Hoke's division, had a line of 2,500 guys, one regiment of cavalry, and two artillery batteries. They got a pretty good setup in case these guys are coming, right? Yep. Um, and the thing about it is all day long, the naval bombardment's going on. Boom, boom, boom. And those 10,000 shots are raining down. Um and you know there, there isn't much being done to the, to the fort, um, but what was interesting though is with how the, the the rebels got the boats because yeah. they were small. They would shoot the balls, they'd skid them across the water. So they'd fire and it'd be like skipping a rock. That's that is how so they did cool. It. Because they couldn't shoot the mass, yeah. so they have to shoot the bottom. So they had to skip them. They took off three boats. That's pretty ingenious, right? But um, when night finally falls on the twenty fourth, the the boats, the Union boats are going to pull back and return to safe, safely out of position. And in the first day's battle, but um, so the, if you're the Union, you feel okay. We fired a lot of iron here, okay. And you're feeling pretty good. Much of, you're feeling pretty good, but not everyone is. The next day is going to be the is going to be the infantry's day. So the next day is Christmas, and this is the day the infantry is going to, is going to make their mark. But it's clear to Godfrey uh, Wenzel, uh, Weitzel, that the Fort Fisher's defenses are still too strong. He just knows. Mm -hmm. So he says, and I quote, I saw plainly that Fort Fisher had not been materially injured by the heavy and accurate shell of fire of the Navy and having a vivid recollection of the two unsuccessful assaults on Fort Wagner, okay, mm -hmm. I returned to General Butler and reported to him that it would be butchery to order an assault on that work under any circumstances, okay? That's yeah. important for later. Uh, what's going to happen. Yeah. Okay. Yet on the other side of that, you have Porter who believes that, you know, because the guns of Fort Fisher have gone pretty much silent. Um, and he believes that this is because there was not a blade of grass or a piece of stick in that fort that was not burned up. Now, the reason the guns are a little bit silent at Fort Fisher is because Lamb was just preserving his ammo and he'd ordered the guns to fire only every half hour unless the fort came under direct assault. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, by morning, it's Christmas Day. They've all opened up their gifts. You know, Santa's come and gone. Okay. Ooh. The, to, okay. <laughs> um, 20, 20 Union vessels are going to start shelling a beach north of, the, of Fort Fisher, yeah. near position of the Rebel defensive line at, at Sugarloaf. Now, the ships are led by the USS Brooklyn, and they're going to pound that Confederate position there um, at a place called Barry Gatlin and Barry Anderson, Battery Anderson. Because what they're trying to do is create that safe spot for the Federal infantry to land. This is that pre-D-Day-like bombardment, right, on Omaha Beach yep. before the amphibious landing is um, is going to be dumped on there. And, and so they're going to get a lot of additional shots to clear that space. But but like I mentioned earlier, okay, the fort is low. It has no walls. It's sand, okay? Um, the only way the boats can see the fort – and this is kind of a cool story with land. Yeah. The only way they can see the fort is by the rebel flags. That's how – that's what they're, they're – 
focusing on. They, yeah. So what Lam, you know, so Lamb realizes if I take the flags down, they can't see us anymore. So guess what he does? He takes the flags down. Yeah. He lowers the flags. He moves them to the back of the fort where the swamps are. Okay. And so now the union's overshooting the fort. And this is good. This is big. As we'll find out later on. Lamb says at least one third of the 20,000 shot and shell fired at the fort on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day went over the fort and into the marsh or into the Cape Fear River. Right. So he, he he's having that situation that you mentioned before. And then he goes on about the powder, waste of power. Yeah. But because they move the flags back and take them down, they can't be seen. And this brings up maybe, maybe one of my favorite Civil War stories of all time, Mary, the story of the mound battery at Fort Fisher. Ooh. Right. So. He Lamb is gonna Lamb. He most of the flags are down. He wants to he wants to raise a f- Confederate flag at a um, at a place called the Mound Battery, which is forty feet high because it's high. He wants to raise the flag so the Union boats can see the flag, kind of a Fort McKinley, but the flag mm-hmm. is still here type thing. They can show, hey, guess what? Ha ha, we're still here. Yep. <laughs> so he's he's good. He's gonna do this. So he wants a volunteer to shimmy up the flagpole to hang the flag up with a flag. Up no. He's gonna put, so the first guy he picks is a guy named Private Bennett. Private Bennett is 200 pounds. He's too fat to climb the pole. Now, honest <laughs> oh to God. He, he, God. Can't, he starts, he can't make it. He comes back down. He can't make it up the pole. So he needs a new volunteer. He gets a volunteer from the 36th North Carolina who must be thin. He's going to put the flag in his mouth, and he's going to climb that thing like I'm climbing a rope in gym class. He's going to go up. Wow. Well, guess what happens? As soon as the, the Union boats see him, they start firing on him. So he's up the flagpole hanging the flag while shells are boom, boom, going all the way around him. He gets the flagpole up. He slides down. Guess what happens? The freaking flag falls off again. Oh, no. So guess what he does? He's going back up again. So here he goes again, flag in his mouth. He's climbing the pole. This time, he gets up to the top. The Union gunners and the rebels all stop, and they start cheering for him. They <laughs> the Union guys. They're like, look at this friggin' guy. And they, they, they're saluting his bravery that he's going to climb a flagpole twice. They just say, you know what? Screw him. Hang your damn flag. He's, he's would so you say, he has determination? He certainly did. He, he, his flagpole was raised. No question about that, <laughs> right? You know, but it's a, it's a great story. Just, just you can just imagine, you know, exactly what's going on. You know, so so by two o'clock, the Union infantry is going to finally hit that beach, led by Brigadier General Newton Martin Curtis. Okay, we'll talk about Curtis in detail here. Yeah. The rest of this, he'll be joined by Weitzel, who's going to show up and his five hundred men from the Fourteenth Corps, and they're going to fight the Rebs who had set up that skirmish line, um, because they want to set up that beachhead. They're going to fight them there. Curtis will have guys from the 142nd New York, the 112th New York. They're going to drive back those Confederate skirmishers who um, back to that main line at Sugarloaf. So now the beachhead's open, right? Yeah. So by 3 o'clock, Weitzel and Curtis are going to advance. They're going to get there. They're going to get within one and a half miles of the land face of Fort Fisher. So they're right there now. Curtis sets up his camp at this at a place called Battery Holland, which is now abandoned. And moves his men, some of them up to 75 yards of the, the fort's actual western face. Yeah. So they're some of them really, really close. So what does Curtis do now? We're talking about people climbing. He's going to send a guy named, uh, named Lieutenant George Simpson up a telegraph pole to climb up and see if he can see inside the fort. So he climbs and he does. And he realizes that the fort, instead of this four-sided monstrosity, is just two sides. And they can take it. So Curtis is like, holy shit. That's <laughs> it. So he's ex- he's happier than you are if you, when you find that last IPA in the back of the fridge and you think it's gone. Right? It was me tonight. Oh, it certainly was, you know. <laughs> um, the, pro- the problem was is that Curtis doesn't have a lot of guys, right? And Weitzel and Butler are afraid that they're not going to be able to take it. They've only got like 500 guys yeah. less than that by the time they get there. So nightfall is looming. It's coming around the bend. And they're sandwiched between Fort Fisher and Sugarloaf. That's where they are right now. And for whatever reason, um, and maybe it's that reason, Butler decides to call the whole damn thing off. He just says the hell with this, right? But before Curtis gets word of this, commander of the second division of the 14th Corps, our old friend Adele Bart Ames, I was about to mention Ames, men, right? yeah. he's going to show up, right? And he arrives at Battery Hall and he's, he looks around and says, you know something? I think you could do this. I think 
um, if you make the assaults, I, I think it's I think it's 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 doable. But Wright is, and he's going to have the third, the one seventeenth, and one forty second New York, and they're going to they're going to make a charge on the fort. While this is going on, the Navy bombardment's still going. All of a sudden, whew, stops. It just stops, right? And all of a sudden, so they got they have no support anymore. This is probably one of two reasons: one, that it's nightfall, but two, Porter probably got the order from Butler that this whole thing is over prior on this yeah. point, right? So what is a what does the Confederates do when the infantry? I mean, when the artillery stops from the boats, right? They're in their bomb proofs. They're going to come running up like it's recess. Yeah, and they're they're all going to start flooding out again, and Whiting and Lamb are going to are going to start pulling out their artillery, and now they're going to start firing on this approaching Union infantry line, which is not that big, and it's right outside of their fort. And the federal guys are stunned. The last thing they expected was was infantry troops to come at them. Yeah, but you know, and it's probably right around at this point when that messenger arrives to tell Curtis that Butler has called the entire operation off to report back to the transport ships. We are getting the f out of Dodge, and this is when he finds out about it. What? Like, right. could you imagine how he must have felt about that? I mean, they did manage to capture a battery that was protecting the beach north of the fort, and they got the surrender of the 4th and the 8th North Carolina, which were just junior reserves, so not a huge deal, but they still got that. But still, you know, Curtis has realized this, like, wow, we could I can take this fort. And then it's just like, nope, we're calling it off kind of thing. Well, it gets it gets worse than that for Curtis and his guys, though, because yeah. they're they're left holding a diaper in the rain at this point. Yeah, so, aren't they there till the twenty seventh or something like well, that? Well, so while everything's going on, while they're getting while they're turning around, getting ready to take their ball and go home, and Curtis is pissed off now. The weather turns to shit. We mm-hmm. talked many many times how weather is a great equalizer, and don't forget it's Christmas time. It's yep. getting really bad out. So the weather gets so bad by the time they reach the landing zone, that beach had to get on the boats. Guess what? The boats are gone, and him and his 500-plus guys are stuck there, and they're going to be stranded there for the next two days yep. waiting, which must have pissed them off, just oh. saying, okay? Well, weather has so, been, like, such an annoyance in this entire expedition because it was originally supposed to leave December 10th, and then it couldn't leave till the 15th, and then uh-huh. another thing, another storm came in on December the 18th, which stopped them, and then this latest weather threat was one of the reasons Butler calls it off. The, the, right, exactly. But the next morning, the 26th, Butler is gone. He's yeah. heading back to Hampton Roads. Fort Fisher remains solidly intact, while Curtis's men are still sitting there sucking their thumbs, right? <laughs> now, what's funny is, around noontime that day, who arrives at Sugarloaf to join the troops f- from Robert Hoke, but our old friend, guess who? Braxton Bragg. Braxton Bragg shows Bragg. up. Right? Braxton Braxton Bragg. Braxton here. He leaves Wilmington, freaks out Wilmington, the citizens freak out that he's leaving. Yep. He does anyway. He comes. But instead of attacking Curtis, okay, who had literally nowhere to go, but he was between the Confederates and the, the, the water. He had nowhere to go. Bragg decides just let them go. Yep. Just don't even waste your time and let them escape. So on the 27th of December, they are going to get hauled off. They're going to get us, they're going to get re- um, sent off. A boat's to finally come for Curtis and his guys. And Colonel Lamb in general whiting are bullshit mm-hmm. they're literally watching the the transport leave with curtis's guys and they they fire a couple of shots just as an and the horse you rode in on type couple of shots yep. as they sailed away but that's all they can really do so and the whole thing is basically over so the night of december 27th now u.s grants and gideon wells are going to find out that butler and porter um, failed to take Fort Fisher despite this overwhelming military force of 64 freaking guns. They couldn't do it. Guess what happens that same day? The blockade starts again. I know. The I was just going to say, like, guess what you starts know? going again? The blockade and the supplies start flowing in. Which, But, I mean, at this time, you have to remember, in late 1864, Sherman has done his damage in Georgia with the railways, ripping them up, and Lee is already going to be feeling that crunch for the supplies because there's certain supplies that come from that area. Like, especially a lot of the ammo that is coming from the ironworks that were in Georgia that aren't able to get to Lee anymore. So he's already feeling that crunch, but still any supplies he can get, he's going to take. And these blockade runners are going again. 
They finally do. You know, um, but Lincoln is like, well, what the, what the hell happened? Yeah. So he's going to message U.S. Grant. He's going to say, if there be no exception, please tell me what you now understand of the Wilmington expedition present and perspective. To which Grant responds, mm-hmm, hmm. the Wilmington expedition has proven to be a gross and culpable failure. Who is to blame? I hope we will know. Ooh. That's what he says. And he knew who it was. He knew. Right? Yeah. David, David Porter quickly, before you can say whatever, he points a butler, blames him for incompetence. And Grant goes, yep, I agree 100 percent. So he is going wow. to pull out his Apple phone there, his iPhone. <laughs> and he's going to and he, he is going to ask Lincoln permission to fire Butler, saying, and I quote, there is a lack of confidence felt in Butler's military ability. Lincoln could barely get his, his rail splitter down. He was so excited. To he, wanted to, <laughs> he wanted to get rid of Butler badly. So he issues general order number one. That's what he called it. Relieving Butler from command and ordering him back to Lowell, Mass, where he's happy to be buried, by the way, in case you're curious, Grant is going to gleefully pass on this message to Butler that he's yep. fired and name Edward Ord to be the general to replace him as that commander of the Army of the James. So as this, this as the sun is setting on this first Fort Fisher battle, okay, the goal was finally Gideon Wells in the Navy are going to get the permission to go and take this thing out. They, because the fort is built um, by Lamb and, and, and um, these Confederates, they can't take it because how the fort is built. Mm-hmm. And the whole thing is mismanaged from, from soup to nuts. It's a complete mess. And they are going to try again a couple of weeks later. We're going to talk about that in our next episode. But I think it's one that goes to show that, um, you know, even with the best planning, the worst people in charge can still screw this thing up. Yep, exactly. Yeah. And and just the fact that, you know, Grant wants Weitzel in charge to begin with, which who knows why, you know, probably because Weitzel might have been a little bit more competent. Who knows how it would have gone I think the weather definitely is a factor in this. Um, and just to, I, I don't think that they knew what they were going up against with this fort either. They didn't know, they hadn't been able to get near enough to it to know how it well, was made. And also well, like when they, when they detonate the Louisiana, it's like almost a mile away from the fort. And Lamb was like, he, like he heard it and he's like, oh, did a union ship run aground? Like what's going on out there? Yeah. And then well, he, he wanted uh, he wanted Weitzel because Weitzel had the experience of the force. Exactly. That's why he wanted. And yeah. so he wanted a guy who knew, you know, he, this is a guy who literally was the right hand man of Dennis Mahanoy. So, yeah. so he knew he needed a guy who could understand the fort. Now, Fort Fisher, um, it was built for that type of attack. It was built to sustain attack from the ocean. Yeah. And it worked out perfectly. And it's still there today. A good percentage of it's still there. And what it what it did was it, it really prove to um, the Confederacy and the Union about how these different forts had to be attacked by different types of types of vehicles. Yeah. But again, but that had to be why Weitzel was picked. Had to have been. Yeah. Oh, I, I completely agree. And and somehow how Butler got around that, like, I don't know, like, was it because of, you know, Lincoln was kind of just like, oh, fine, he can be in charge or was the letter just never received well, by I, Weitzel he, he, and he, but Weitzel was there. Lincoln was very adamant that Grant approved this plan. And Grant never and so, really did. Grant was kind of like, eh, I don't know if it's going to work. Well, no, but he, he, he knew that if, if he got, if he got the buy in, he could do it. So Grant's like, okay, we'll do it. And I think Grant wanted his guy to run it. He didn't like Butler either. And I think, you know, if, if the story is true, that Butler intercepted the plans that the message white, so likely never knew he was in charge. He was told to be in charge. Yeah. Butler just 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 hosied it and grabbed it and says, I'm in charge. So Butler kind of does what McClernand did at Arkansas Post when he tells Sherman, oh, I'm in charge, and this is the Army of the Mississippi now. Yeah. Even though he really wasn't. He did exactly the same thing, pretty much. Oh, he did. He did. And in Butler, again, he, 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 this plan with the blowing up the USS Louisiana was probably was, – it wasn't going to work. But um, he did want to be there when it went off, but he ends up with that. The weather gets screwed up and he decides to go to Buford for Christmas and, and Porter does it anyway. And, and he's, it's, 
the whole thing was a comedy of errors. Mm -hmm. um, but there was so much intrigue with Lamb taking the flags down and moving the flags around. I mean, they were, you weren't making fun of Claiborne with the chess. They were playing chess while the union was playing checkers. Uh, uh, they really were. They, they absolutely were. Like, Lamb is absolutely brilliant in this. And he's he's a guy in the Civil War. He He's like Kimball, you know, on the mm -hmm. union side. Never gets talked about. And he's doing, and I mean, now Lamb's not in as many areas as what Kimball's in. Like, Kimball's in Eastern Theater, Western Theater, and all that. And at a lot of different battles, Lamb is just at Fort Fisher. But, you know, he's doing all this shit to keep the union, like, basically guessing constantly right right and i mean things no, don't work the, out so well for lamb uh i mean like they're not bad bad but we'll talk more about that in the second episode about what happens to him yeah things things go the other way you know when, when there's other people in charge and you know that's gonna we're gonna you know the for, battle for fisher to the search for curly's gold we'll talk about <laughs> next week right but um but I think it is important to look at some of the, some of these um, this initial thing because they, what they what it proved was you know they can get as much iron down, but without a real solid plan. Yeah. Um. Could could you know if Curtis had more men, would he be able to take? He probably would have. They didn't mm -hmm. send that many guys across. They didn't understand. They didn't have no way to recon. You know, they had no Google Earth to look down to see what yeah. the, how the fort was. Well, set they should up. have used Waze. Waze is way better than. Yeah, uh, you know that, that the area around there. Oh no, that's Cape directions, area, right? Google Earth. Duh. No, but but regardless, I I think you know what. But what it did do is it did give them re the recon was the first battle of Fort Fisher. That was their test. Yeah. Okay, now we know what we're dealing with. So they came back a couple of weeks later. In a, and it was a little bit different history of how this is going to go. But we don't want to spoil the ending. Maybe we're going to no, save that for next we week. We got to do so part two. We'll save part two. But so Fort Fisher's one. It's going to be again. You know, another bad day for Butler. You know, yep. um, and it's going to drive that wedge between him and the military again. It's going to continue his hate with David Porter that stemmed back in his days in New Orleans with them themselves together when they helped seize the fort in New Orleans and Butler's took all the supplies and all the stuff that he did. But it's again, it's all this like, it's all this intrigue going on in the background with the personalities, right? No, I know it certainly is. It certainly is. So let's let's leave it there and let's put let's put the guys back in the boats for a little while and put the guys back in the fort. Let's put Lamb in um in whiting back in their forts and we'll send um the navy back to hampton roads and let them let them recoup and lick yeah. their wounds and we'll we'll give them a couple of days and we'll get back to them next week and we'll talk about the second battle of fort fisher which is going to be a little different like we mentioned we will yes we will. so next week we'll be talking second fort fisher um for those listening on if you're listening to this when this drops on saturday uh mm -hmm. our facebook live is going to be sunday at 10 um and next wednesday is our first round table of 2022 so oh. if y'all are interested in joining us for that uh info at civil war breakfast club.com we will send you an invite i'm going to be sending the invites out uh this weekend probably for for that so just come nerd out about the civil war with us via zoom 6 p.m eastern time and then two weeks uh from uh wednesday from wednesday so the 26th of January, we are having our first book club meeting of 2022, which we are going to be discussing uh, Tom McMillan's book, um, Hancock or Armistead and Hancock. And we will be joined by Tom McMillan, the author, for that discussion. So if you would like to attend that, info at civilwarbreakfastclub.com, 6 p.m. Eastern Time via Zoom. Should be because I'm looking forward to that. So it was a good discussion. So as we head off, as we always do, I always ask you that one final question, Mary, which is any final words from you, Fincheru? <laughs> well, thank you to all our listeners. You guys are awesome. Um, we really appreciate all of you jumping onto our Facebook Lives too uh, when we do them because you guys always ask us a lot of great questions and it's a lot of great discussion and we learn a lot from you as well. Um, and thanks to you, Darren, for bringing it as you always do. You are an awesome co-host. and well, I do my best, but I've got an ex someone else in my corner to help me out. <laughs> Funko Mary. Always, oh, always help me out with that. So, all right. So <laughs> off we go. Everybody, thanks for listening again. We appreciate it. We will see you all in our lives. We'll see you all next time as we head off to Fort Fisher. We stay in South and uh, North Carolina. I almost said South Carolina. We'll go in, back into North Carolina again. We'll finish this up and we'll talk about Fort Fisher part two. So off we go. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. You guys have a great night. Have a great weekend. Stay safe. Stay warm. Go Patriots and look forward to talking to you all on the other side. See y'all later. Bye.